Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Kosick. Welcome to the workshop, Chronic Graft versus Host Disease of the Skin and Connective Tissues. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Adi Modi. Dr. Modi is the Assistant Clinical Professor in the Division of Dermatology at the City of Hope Cancer Center. His clinical care and research focus on high-risk skin cancers, melanoma, and skin effects caused by graft versus host disease. Dr. Modi also co-directs the City of Hope Chronic Graft versus Host Disease Clinic. Please joining me in welcoming Dr. Modi. Okay, thank you, uh, Michelle, for that kind introduction. Um, just to reiterate, my name is <clears throat> Bajri Modi. I am uh, sitting in my office at City of Hope in Duarte, uh, California. Uh, I want to first thank the uh, organizers for um, inviting me to participate in this very important symposia. Uh, I feel honored to be able to uh, speak to you all today, uh, and I am very grateful for uh, all of the efforts that the organizers uh, have put forward to, um, you know, making sure we have uh, submitted everything on time and also organizing this as a virtual event. Uh, this past year has been very challenging for everyone, and uh, it's terrific that we can still continue to do uh, these types of important educational events virtually. And seems like we can potentially even reach more people. So uh, with that said, let me see if I can progress my slides. There we go. So I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes uh, talking to you uh, about your skin and chronic graft-versus-host disease. I don't spend that much time speaking about acute graft-versus-host disease. Um, my talk is primarily on chronic graft-versus-host disease. Uh, just uh, first as routine, I need to disclose uh, any financial disclosures. Um, I have participated as a consultant speaker uh, for Santa Fe Genzyme and Regeneron, primarily with regards to uh, high-risk skin cancers. Um, and I have participated in an advisory board to discuss chronic GBHD therapies for a company called Cadman. Learning objectives for today, uh, we will review briefly the risk factors for developing chronic graft versus host disease of the skin. Uh, the majority of this talk is going to be reviewing the various manifestations of chronic graft versus host disease uh, of the skin. Uh, and then we'll briefly touch on therapies available to manage GBHD of the skin. And finally, uh, I, will, I was asked to speak a little bit about skin cancer after bone marrow transplantation, which is also a very important topic to, uh, to our patients who undergo transplantation. So probably by day three now into the symposium, you've seen some version of this graph at some point, and you know that uh, the number of bone marrow transplants is on the rise. So the number of transplants that are being carried out in this country are on the rise. and. Uh, Therefore, the number of individuals who will be dealing with chronic graft versus host disease is also expected to rise. So what is chronic graft versus host disease? Well, in my opinion, it's the major barrier to an otherwise successful transplant. HCSCT stands for hematopoietic stem cell transplant uh, in patients who have not had uh, relapse of their disease. It occurs in more than, by some estimates, more than 50% of patients who have undergone an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And <clears throat> patients with chronic graft versus host disease have a reduced quality of life uh, and an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. It's a very important uh, condition to be speaking on and know about. And I, I tell folks that it resembles, or the way I think about it, is that it resembles autoimmune disease that would have occur that may occur in patients who've never had a transplant. So as we'll go through the various morphologies of chronic graft versus host disease, are uh, non-transplant related uh, correlates uh, in non-transplant related autoimmune diseases. So what are the risk factors for developing chronic GVHD? Uh, well, these are the ones that we typically think of. So patients who had a history of prior acute graft versus host disease, patients who received a peripheral blood stem cell graft, uh, patients who uh, 
male uh, hosts or male patients who received uh, stem cells from a female donor um, are at a higher risk of developing chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, patients who were older in age when they received uh, their uh, stem cell transplant. Uh, and, and finally, um, sort of an obvious one is folks who uh, have a high HLA disparity between the recipient and donor, meaning that the match level between the host and the recipient uh, wasn't very high, uh, yet it was very important to go to transplant. Uh, these are some of the risk factors that are described. <clears throat> I wanted to first sort of talk about what the patient experience uh, with graft-versus-host disease is like. And this is an important study uh, that came out of Seattle uh, of around 1,400 patients who completed just a patient survey about quality of life symptoms, health status, and comorbid conditions and medications that they took. These patients of the 1,400, about 20% reported that they had mild chronic graft versus host disease, and 10% reported either moderate or severe graft versus host disease. About a, uh, a quarter, 28% of patients, never had any chronic graft versus host disease, and about 20% of patients had chronic graft versus host disease, but it had resolved. And uh, about 24% of patients did not complete the survey. Folks who developed the moderate to severe chronic graft versus host disease, or reported that they had chronic to severe, uh, moderate to severe chronic graft versus host disease, they were more likely to report a worse quality of life, a lower performance status, and more likely to take prescription medications for pain, anxiety, and depression. And a hopeful point about this study is that the self-reported measures were similar between those who had resolved chronic graft versus host disease and those who never had it to begin with. So treating and successfully treating chronic graft versus host disease does seem to improve the patient's experience with the syndrome. Where does graft versus host disease manifest? Well, uh, I'm a dermatologist, <clears throat> and so the skin and other cutaneous structures are sort of near and dear to my heart. Uh, and the skin is actually the most common uh, place where graft versus host disease manifests. Uh, you can see that the next most common area is the mouth, and uh, beyond that, the eyes, gut, liver. Um, these are all things that other uh, uh, talks have probably covered today. We're going to focus mostly on skin today. Before we get started into the morphology of chronic graft versus host disease, I first like to kind of show you how I think about chronic graft versus host disease. I'm a very simple-minded thinker. I like to think about things anatomically, uh, and, and that sort of makes sense to me as we talk about how chronic GVHD make, uh, manifests. So there are four major layers of the skin. There's the topmost layer, which is called the epidermis, and it's made up of skin cells that are rapidly dividing and sort of flake off. Uh, and below that, <clears throat> uh, you have the dermis, okay? The dermis is made up of mostly this amorphous protein called collagen that makes up the bulk of the, of the skin. It sort of forms the integrity of the skin. Also, you can see that in the dermis, you've got hair follicles coming in. You've got some skin muscles, you've got nerves, you've got sweat glands, uh, and, and important structures. Below that is the subcutaneous fat, uh, which is mostly, uh, there's subcutaneous fat all over your body, including on the thinnest part of your eye, uh, skin, such as the eyes, or even on the thickest part of your body, uh, the, the skin on the back, which is about 20 times thicker than the skin on the eyes. And below that, you've got fascia, which essentially serves to sort of tether the skin down, and that's what attaches your skin to your body. And so you've got muscle underneath there or perhaps bone. In graft-versus-host disease, you've got the donor's immune cells uh, that come in and attack various parts of the skin. And where it attacks and where it causes damage, uh, and thereby inflammation, injury, and repair, 
is really important in thinking about what type of morphology uh, of graft versus host disease is going to develop. And so my talk, uh, where, I, where I review the different uh, morphologies, will really kind of hone in on this anatomic diagram to help you think about the different subtypes of skin, graft versus host disease. So what are the symptoms that patients will mention to their doctors? So, um, you know, patients will say, I have a rash or I'm feeling very itchy. Uh, they'll also uh, describe perhaps uh, I've noticed changes in my skin color or doc, I've noticed that I'm no longer able to sweat as much or I've noticed that my hair is falling out or um, in other cases, uh, patients will describe um, skin sores and ulcerations. Uh, this column to the right is uh, what we consider the more uh, severe cases of chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, and in these cases, we'll see loss of the integrity of the skin that leads to these sores and skin breakdown. We'll also see potentially some inflammatory processes that lead to thickening and scar-like development of the skin which then can lead to reduced mobility of the skin. We don't really understand why some patients go on to develop this type of GBHD where they're developing uh, tightening and thickening of the skin, whereas others maybe simply develop discoloration. Uh, but we know it occurs and we know that it can cause reduced mobility. Uh, some of this mobility uh, reduction may be noted around the mouth. Well, they'll say, uh, patients may say, that I can't open my mouth as much. Um, or also, very importantly, they'll, they'll notice there's a reduction in movement around joints, um, primarily uh, around the shoulders, elbows, wrists, uh, and even ankles. Um, some patients may uh, describe some dimpling or rippling of their skin, uh, which is commonly called cellulite, or maybe more appropriately called pseudocellulite. And I'll show you some photographs of that. And concerningly, some patients may uh, describe difficulty with taking a deep breath because there has been some tightening of the skin around their chest trunk. Historically, the morphologies of chronic skin GVHD uh, were described as either scleroderma or lichen planus. But as we've learned more, we recognize that, in fact, uh, there are uh, many more morphologies of chronic graft disease that can occur in the skin. Uh, we'll review uh, these that are listed here. Uh, and these include sclerotic and morphia-like, lichen planus and lichen sclerosis-like. We'll discuss pigmentary changes, and we'll discuss eczema and papulosquamous-like graft versus host disease. So going back to that diagram, uh, I'm going to essentially start uh, at the bottom of the skin in sort of reverse order and go up from that. And the reason for that is uh, the uh, inflammation and the damage that may occur from graft versus host disease in the deeper parts of the skin tends to lead to uh, more severe graft versus host disease. Uh, so this is uh, an example of a patient who has uh, maybe fascial damage, uh, uh, which is resulting in this sort of dimpling-like appearance or pseudocellulite-like changes, and uh, even what we call a dry riverbed uh, that's developing in the forearm. Uh, and the reason that's occurring is because the fascia is essentially uh, inflamed and scarred down, and it's retracting the skin above it and causing it to kind of be tethered down. <clears throat> there's a tendon that runs right there in the middle uh, of your forearm, and the fascia uh, near that is kind of pulling down, and, and that's why you're seeing those spaces. Uh, here's an example of, but oh, just to return, um, another feature that we look for uh, as clinicians is the pinchability of the skin. Uh, most normal skin will allow you to pinch your skin and grab skin between it, but patients with sclerotic skin changes have a reduced pinchability, and it is a sign of deeper skin scarring. 
When this type of scarring occurs around a joint, such as the shoulders, elbows, or wrists, patients will notice a reduction in the range of motion around that joint, and that can be very debilitating. Here's another example of skin thickening or sclerosis, or also called scleroderma. Uh, as mentioned previously, when developed around the chest or trunk area, a major concern is that patients' ability to expand their chest to take deep breaths becomes limited. We send these patients for pulmonary function testing to objectively evaluate for this concern uh, so we can pick, pick up on it early. If sclerotic symptoms are noted, what can you do? Well, your, pa your transplant doctor will discuss various systemic therapy options with you, which I will list later, to try and slow down the progression and hopefully reverse some of these symptoms. In addition, I really emphasize non-medication interventions such as regular stretching, physical therapy, yoga, and exercise as able. Anecdotally, many of my patients have expressed that these physical efforts have allowed them to adapt to their new limitations and slowly improve their range of motion and functionality. I have several patients who are remarkable and inspiring in the activities that they are able to continue to do. One patient of mine comes to mind, uh, continues his passion of painting despite having significant scarring and, and reduction in mobility in his wrists, and he uh, has really made an effort to uh, continue in these, in, uh, in these passions of his. Of his. Uh, this is a localized uh, form of sclerosis called morphia. Uh, morphia refers to an autoimmune disease that occurs in the non-transplant setting, uh, and it uh, presents as sclerotic areas of the skin that are very localized. Um, again, we don't know why some people develop sclerosis in a more widespread manner, while others can develop it in a very localized fashion. There are some reports that, that external forces or trauma can trigger sclerosis. For example, it is often noted that the waistline will develop morphia-like skin thickening related to the pressure from the elastic band and belt around the waist. In addition, another example of localized sclerosis is that we often see it in areas of prior skin damage. Uh, one type of specific skin damage that's commonly reported about is uh, areas of the skin that have previously had shingles. So a patient has had shingles, uh, they've gone on later to have a transplant, or they had shingles after the transplant, but at that time did not have any chronic GBHD, and down the road they develop chronic GBHD just in the area, or sclerosis just in the area of the prior shingles uh, infection. And so clearly um, trauma or skin damage seems to trigger, uh, you know, development of skin sclerosis, or at least is one trigger. Going back to this anatomic diagram, moving more superficially in the skin, another morphologic subtype of chronic GVHD uh, that we observe is, is called lichen sclerosis. And this occurs when there's chronic inflammation in the superficial area of the skin that ultimately leads to thinning out of the skin, something that we refer to as atrophy. And this atrophic skin is very prone to tearing and ulcerating. Here's another example of thinning and fibrosis of the superficial skin. And when I zoom in on what the skin looks like, it often has this sort of cigarette paper like wrinkled appearance that's very typical of atrophic skin. The skin is prone to kind of tearing or easily breaking down. Also, uh, a, another case of superficial uh, inflammation uh, is something that's referred to as lichen planus, like graft versus host disease, uh, as opposed to the uh, atrophy seen in the previous case, uh, this tends to lead to overgrowth of the top layer of the skin. So this is an example of a patient uh, with uh, chronic lichen planus like chronic graft versus host disease developing as, uh, presenting as itchy bumps in his 
in her hand. Uh, and here's another example of it being a little more widespread. And this is a zoomed in uh, photo of what these individual skin lesions look like. Uh, they're often referred to as purple papules or bumps. Uh, and they have this classic uh, thin white scaling on top of the lesion. Patients with this rash tend to also develop scaling and symptoms in their mouth as well as potentially on the genitals. These lichen planus-like uh, uh, skin chronic graft-free host disease is more likely to respond to skin-directed therapies that we'll go over here soon. Finally, another superficial um, skin chronic graft-versus-host disease, another morphology, I should say, is something that we refer to as papulosquamous. The, super, the superficial inflammation here leads to overgrowth of the top layer, and it causes rashes that may mimic psoriasis or eczema. Uh, these patients may experience itching, and because of the excessive scaling, they may have discomfort from their skin uh, because it may crack. Um, so the skin essentially um, becomes what we call hyperkeratotic, or it keeps up. It doesn't sort of fall off. And that skin, when it dries out, can fissure and crack, and that can be very painful to whoever's experiencing it. Moisturizing and using topical medications are really helpful for this type of chronic graft resistance disease. Perhaps the most common skin finding uh, that I see in patients who have undergone a bone marrow transplant is pigmentary changes. I often say to my patients that this is, quote, the mask of transplant that shows the evidence that, you know, you've had a prior transplant. Focusing on the two photos on the left, uh, which are of the same individual, um, this is a very typical pattern of pigmentary change that we see. This patient experienced inflammation that was triggered by his graft-versus-host disease, and it essentially led to a disruption of the normal distribution of pigment that's already been sort of laid down throughout the skin. So prior to the graft-versus-host disease, there's already a pattern of pigment that's very important for uh, determining kind of what your skin looks like. When you have an inflammatory process like graft-versus-host disease, that distribution pattern gets messed up and uh, you get this sort of scattered dispigmentation or some areas of low pigmentation and some areas of higher pigmentation develop. It's one of the most common types of skin changes that we see in patients after their transplant and it can be of varying degrees of severity. Now, if you focus to the right photo, you see a very distinct pattern of pigment loss that's consistent with a condition called vitiligo-like graft-versus-host disease. In this case, the immune system is attacking the specific cells that are responsible for producing and storing the pigment in the skin, and those cells are called melanocytes. This case was a very interesting case uh, because his son was his donor, and his son actually has autoimmune vitiligo. He's never had a transplant, never had leukemia, but he does have a autoimmune disease in which immune cells are attacking his melanocytes. And when his stem cells were used to, as donor stem cells and given to the father, the exact same skin condition developed. And it, it sort of is, in some ways, a proof of principle that it is the immune system that plays an important part in the development of these chronic graft-versus-host disease symptoms. Now, before moving on, I want to make a few comments about post-transplant pigmentary changes. One, reversing pigmentary changes is very challenging, particularly when it's on a widespread scale. Most pigmentary changes that occur after transplant do improve with time, but they may not fully resolve. Uh, I tell patients that folks who are interacting with you 
after several years may notice improvement and they may get to a place where they're not even seeing the pigmentary changes, but you'll always sort of be aware of it. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, because traditional treatments for graft-versus-host disease that are immunosuppressive, so tr uh, traditional systemic treatments, are not aimed at reversing the pigmentary change. And that statement is important because pigmentary change should not be really used as a measure of disease improvement. Most disease improvement measures uh, have more to do with uh, the uh, body surface area of inflammatory rashes or sclerosis. And so I think it's important to have that perspective uh, as a patient. Uh, in some patients, the pigmentary changes uh, are very significant and cause very understandable emotional distress. And in those clinical settings, uh, I tend to be as supportive as I can, and I'm, I, I try to remind patients uh, uh, about the fact that the pigmentary changes will improve with time. And I may offer uh, a low-potency topical retinoid uh, to help with improving the balance of the color. I've had some patients who have uh, been very happy with the improvement in their skin uh, pigmentation after the use of topical retinoids. However, I have to be very careful in kind of uh, uh, ensuring that the expectations are not that the skin color will go back to totally normal. And I have to be careful as a dermatologist to monitor for uh, any skin irritation uh, because these topical retinoids can have side effects. <clears throat> Finally, uh, the nails are a part of the skin, or I should say they are an extension of the skin. And so nail changes are also common in chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, and unfortunately, these two are very challenging to reverse. Uh, most patients uh, are not affected by it significantly or bothered by it, but some patients uh, do express significant concern over these changes. And in that scenario, I might consider in injecting um, steroid into the stem cell of the nail, okay? So that's the proximal portion of the nail where it inserts into the skin. Uh, that's typically where the GVHD inflammation is occurring. And the steroid is, is hopefully going to reduce the inflammation in the stem cells of the nail. However, I always remind patients that it is uh, not 100% effective. Um, and so, you know, we really have to sort of um, measure our expectations about the improvement on uh, the nail uh, changes. Um, and in addition, it, it sometimes can be a very uh, painful procedure to sit through. And so would only really recommend it if a patient is expressing significant concern over the nail. So focusing a little bit more on treatment-specific <clears throat> concerns, uh, there are uh, two sort of uh, kind of categories of treatment for chronic skin graft versus host disease uh, from a dermatologist's perspective. There's skin-directed therapy, which are primarily going to be uh, organized and managed uh, by a dermatologist or with the assistance of a dermatologist, and there are systemic uh, therapies, and your transplant doctor typically is the quarterback in managing uh, your systemic therapies. <clears throat> Skin-directed therapies uh, include topical anti-inflammatory medications, uh, including topical steroids um, and topical non-steroids, which are primarily calcineurin inhibitors. Topical steroids are the mainstay of uh, uh, management tools for uh, dermatologists, uh, and they are used very often. So you might have come across some of these. Uh, and then there's also phototherapy, uh, which may or may not be available uh, at your uh, clinical provider's office. Uh, this is a skin-directed therapy that harnesses the uh, immune modulatory effects of 
targeted wavelength of ultraviolet radiation or light. Uh, and there's three main types. There's ultraviolet A uh, phototherapy. There's ultraviolet A in combination with sorolin, uh, which is a medication that I'll talk about. And there's ultraviolet B uh, phototherapy. Now, just to, uh, as a kind of 40,000 foot view about these skin-directed therapies, uh, we tend to see a higher efficacy for superficial subtypes of chronic graft-resistant disease, like the ones I mentioned, like in planus, the lichenoid, psoriasiform, or exemesis. Uh, and this should make sense. Uh, the medications that are skin-directed are going to uh, only be able to penetrate so deeply uh, and so are more likely to uh, have an impact on uh, the superficial areas uh, that they that they interact with. Sclerotic subtypes are less likely to improve uh, with skin-directed therapy, although there are some reports. Turning to topical steroids, uh, this um, photograph uh, demonstrates kind of how many different topical steroids there are. And as a dermatologist, I'm really thinking about three main issues when I'm deciding which one to use. I'm thinking of uh, the potency of the topical steroid. Uh, and the potencies range from very mild uh, potency topical steroids, which uh, essentially you can get over the counter, so everyone's probably heard of cortisone 10. Uh, that's about the mildest topical steroid you can find. Uh, and it ranges from super, super potent uh, topical steroids, uh, such as clobetazole and uh, betamethasone. What also is important is how the medication is delivered. Is it delivered in an ointment, which is greasy, or is it delivered in a solution, which is very watery and liquidy? Um, there's a whole range of uh, different vehicles uh, that the medication can be delivered in, and that's relevant because uh, the um, the vehicle determines in some ways how effective uh, it is at delivering the medication. So ointments are more effective at delivering uh, steroid uh, than is a watery uh, vehicle like a solution. And finally, we'll consider uh, site-specific uh, issues. So uh, the skin on the eyelid is very thin, about a millimeter thick, <clears throat> and it's going to be able to handle topical steroids less well compared to uh, the skin on the back, which is about two centimeters thick. By an important point is that uh, overusing topical steroids uh, can be damaging to the skin, so very important to avoid overuse and really use them as directed. Calcineurin inhibitors are um, medications that you may have heard of, for example, tacrolimus. These are a safe alternative to topical steroids. However, the downside is they can be expensive. Cannot emphasize enough uh, how important uh, dry skin care is and moisturizing is to uh, patients with graft versus host disease. Um, it is especially helpful uh, for patients who are prone to dryness and experience itching. And it's also helpful for patients who have uh, areas of excessive scaling, uh, such as these two examples that have uh, had skin cancer ruled out. Uh, these types of excessive scaling areas tend to crack um, and fissure, and that can be very painful, especially when it's on the feet or on the hands. I have these two photographs uh, on the right here of Aquaphor and Eucerin, just uh, so that people are aware that these are these are just widely available, very effective moisturizers. Um, I'm not endorsing these specific brands. Um, I'm just listing them here because they're widely available, affordable, and they come in large volumes. But really the key is to get what you like and use it. Um, very quick uh, uh, slide on phototherapy. Um, <clears throat> so phototherapy is used because the effects of uh, ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B have been shown to uh, modulate the immune system. Um, I will be brief on the slide and just mention that 
UVA phototherapy is sort of losing its place in uh, dermatologic care, um, in part because the machines are not as widely available. And uh, UVB phototherapy machines are still used. Generally, um, these interventions are better at treating uh, the superficial subtypes of graft versus disease than they are the deeper subtypes like sclerosis. And finally, a common question that comes up about phototherapy is, is one about what are the skin cancer risks associated with phototherapy? Um, my brief answer is that we don't know for sure what the long-term effects are uh, because the studies haven't you know, really been done. However, these therapies have been a long, around for a long time, and they, in the case of UVB phototherapy, dermatologists generally do not feel that there's a significant added skin cancer risk because it's such a narrow spectrum of sunlight or light. This is a long list of systemic therapies that are primarily going to be managed uh, by your transplant doctor. Uh, typically, we start with corticosteroids uh, at the onset of symptom development. Uh, and in the last few years, there's been a, a large um, number of new, there's been a number of new medications that have been sort of tested in clinical trials uh, to treat chronic graft versus host disease. Uh, and so um, certainly I think the next five to 10 years, we are going to be an explosion of novel treatment approaches to chronic GVHD. And so, um, you know, definitely keep your eyes open for these. I want to finish out by talking about skin cancer. Um, <clears throat> Non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancers occur at a higher rate in patients who undergo bone marrow transplantation. Uh, that's been shown in several different studies. And uh, so just having undergone a bone marrow transplantation and the immunosuppression associated with that seems to be associated with uh, a, a higher risk of, uh, of developing skin cancers. Um, in addition, we suspect that having chronic graft versus disease also uh, is associated with uh, increased skin cancer. So very important to self-monitor and watch out for skin cancer. Uh, dermatologists tend to recommend self-monitoring every one to two months at home to find a partner to you know, sort of watch your back uh, and evaluate your skin um, for uh, signs and symptoms of skin cancer. Uh, in addition, uh, it's recommended to have an annual screening with a dermatologist after you've undergone a bone marrow transplant. And importantly, practice sun safety. Ultraviolet light exposure is really the only modifiable risk factor. And please, no tanning bed, tanning booth use uh, in my opinion, this is the cigarettes of skin cancer. We know that cigarettes lead to lung cancer in the same way we know that tanning booth use leads to uh, the development of skin cancer in the future. Uh, so these are what skin cancers look like. Uh, these are what dermatologists are looking for uh, when they're evaluating you. This is not, it can look like a lot of different other things as well, but these are the most common uh, looking lesions. Uh, so on the left, you have a basal cell carcinoma, which shows up as a pink, shiny bump. Uh, it may bleed. It may open up and develop a sore uh, that heals and then does the same thing. Uh, they typically occur on sun-exposed areas like the face uh, and the top of the ears. Uh, and they're diagnosed uh, tip most typically uh, in a dermatology exam, so seeing a dermatologist and having skin screening. Uh, same is true about uh, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is a typical. This is a different form of skin cancer, but it's also an important one, and it uh, develops as these pink, scaly plaques. Sometimes they can be tender. Uh, sometimes uh, they can just keep up. Uh, they can bleed. Uh, again, they are often discovered by your dermatologist or a patient coming in saying, "Doc, I've developed this spot." Uh, what is it? And we also are always on the lookout for melanoma, which in some ways is the most ominous type of skin cancer. It, it certainly has, um, I think, the most uh, uh, patients are often most aware of it. Uh, we describe the ABCDEs of melanoma. Uh, 
to screen for melanoma. So A standing for asymmetry, B standing for irregular borders, C standing for abnormal or different colors, D standing for an enlarging or enlarged diameter greater than six millimeters. And finally, E uh, for evolution. This is by far the most important feature to look for, uh, and that refers to uh, spots that are changing. Um, <clears throat> a spot that is changing is very, very important, and that's why looking at your skin um, every one to two months is the best way to pick up on ev uh, evolving skin lesions. Finally, uh, this is a handout from the American skin cancer prevention efforts. Um, really, the only modifiable risk factor is sun protection. Uh, so it shows, you know, getting clothing or accessories to uh, uh, reduce your sun exposure to your skin. And importantly, wearing sunscreen in areas of skin that are not uh, covered by uh, clothing. And one issue that I'll bring up, or one sort of point that I want to make, is that uh, uh, the common sunscreen mistakes are forgetting to reapply. So patients will put on their sunscreen before they're going to the beach. They'll get to the beach an hour or so later, and it'll be by the by that time they'll need to reapply the sunscreen. So don't forget to reapply every one to two hours. Um, I recommend a broad spectrum sunscreen that's water resistant and anything that's greater than an SPF 30. Finally, in summary. Uh, uh, we've reviewed a lot here. Um, we've uh, broadly reviewed that chronic GVHD is a common uh, condition after transplant and a major barrier to health. Uh, the skin is the most likely involved organ, uh, most commonly involved organ, and symptoms can manifest with one of several morphologies. Uh, the treatment for chronic skin GVHD can either be skin directed. Uh, or systemic therapies or combination. And finally, uh, chronic GVHD is a chronic syndrome and um, has a, uh, a huge impact on quality of life, but I think with early detection and appropriate treatment and intervention, uh, quality of life can be improved. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Modi, for this excellent presentation, incredibly informative. We have got a lot of folks asking some great questions. Um, as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And we're going to start this question and answer period with um, this one. I have mild GVH on the face and neck for three years. It's controlled by steroid creams. Is this going to be lifelong or will it eventually dissipate? Also, does this increase other concerns like melanoma? That's a, an excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, <clears throat> if I were to see you uh, in clinic, I would first in my mind try to evaluate the specific morphology of uh, chronic graft person host disease. Uh, is it uh, one of the superficial inflammatory chronic graft person host disease uh, subtypes uh, that is going to be uh, likely to improve with topical steroids or uh, perhaps topical uh, tacrolimus or pimacrolimus? Uh, if it's one of the deeper or the dispigmentation uh, type of graft versus host disease, uh, in particular, pigmentary change, I would uh, really try to counsel uh, about the fact that there will be slow improvement over time uh, with the pigmentary change. And if the pigmentary change is still uh, an important concern, uh, as it very likely may be uh, because of the development on the face, uh, I might consider using um, some topical uh, treatments such as topical retinoids, uh, which are good at uh, balancing out skin color. Now, I don't expect there to be sort of a perfect response. Um, it, you know, these, these interventions are done sort of with a grain of salt and, and knowing that it may not achieve kind of perfect results, but 
uh, I have had patients um, express satisfaction with improvement in their pigmentary changes with the use of some of these topical medications. But thank you for that question. Oh, in regards to your skin cancer question, absolutely. I think anybody who's had a bone marrow transplant really needs to be vigilant about all the things that we mentioned uh, with regards to um, uh, skin cancer prevention. So uh, things uh, like self-monitoring every one to two months, annual screenings with your dermatologist, uh, and practicing sun safety. Michelle, next question. Absolutely. That's great advice for all of us, for sure. Um, the next question is, can chronic skin GVH manifest itself at any time after an aloe transplant? And if so, what are the common triggers? Uh, th thank you for that question. That is also an excellent question. And <clears throat> it's one that's a little hard to uh, be entirely clear, uh, sort of specific on, but I think the broad answer is yes. Uh, it can occur any time after a transplant. Uh, I think it's more likely to occur within three three years after your transplant, uh, and it's therefore less likely to occur sort of three to five years after uh, your transplant. In terms of triggers, uh, traditionally we think of triggers being um, things that sort of rev up your immune system. Uh, so uh, in some scenarios, uh, experiencing a viral illness uh, where your immune system is now needing to adapt and be revved up to respond to the virus, uh, it may also inadvertently sort of rev up and uh, be more inclined to attack your own body or your own skin and lead to GVHD symptoms. Um, <clears throat> similarly, um, some patients have to uh, undergo things like donor lymphocyte infusions uh, after their transplant. And in that scenario, you're basically getting an impulse of new uh, immune cells that may inadvertently target uh, your skin or other organs. Uh, another trigger that we think about um, is uh, tapering of the immune immunosuppression uh, after you undergo your transplant. So let's say you've you know received your bone marrow transplant and three to six months later everything's going smoothly, you're in remission, your counts are holding up. Uh, your transplant doctor may uh, begin to taper off. Uh, whatever your post-transplant GVHG prophylactic medications were. Um, we do sometimes see graft-versus-host come out in that setting, and that makes a lot of sense because the medicines you were taking were doing a really good job of suppressing the GVHD, and once the medications are being tapered, GVHD may start to develop. And in that scenario, uh, the transplant doctors often slow down their taper, or they may go back up to uh, the previous dose, uh, but it's really case specific. Thank Michelle? you. The next question is, is photodynamic therapy safe for precancer on the face for people that have chronic GVHD? And then there seems to be some question about um, what should that exposure be if they do receive that treatment in terms of time frame? <clears throat> so photodynamic therapy uh, for folks um, who don't know what that is, um, I did not mention it in my, uh, my talk, but photodynamic therapy is a specific treatment for pre-skin cancers. And uh, it's a treatment that's aimed at targeting something called an actinic keratosis, uh, which has a small percentage of developing into a squamous cell carcinoma. It's a tool that dermatologists use, uh, use to treat an entire area of the body uh, rather than um, uh, treating sort of individual lesions with something like cryotherapy. Um, I don't tend to... Uh, push for something like photodynamic therapy until or unless I feel uh, the patient's chronic graft versus disease is stable. Um, so what I mean by stable, I mean that the patient has uh, either their graft versus disease has resolved 
or that the graft resistant disease has been very stable and there's been no new medications added, that even the transplant doctor is able to reduce the medications. And if that specific patient has a lot of actinic keratoses, I might pursue photodynamic therapy to treat the, photo, to treat the actinic keratoses. Um, I would probably start with something like liquid nitrogen treatment of individual actinic keratoses uh, rather than jumping to something like photodynamic therapy. Uh, but I do think eventually it is a safe thing to try. Excellent. Michelle. There are several questions um, that um, our audience has asked on whether or not the pseudocellulite appearance or any other changes in their skin um, after transplant are permanent or not. Can you answer that question? Um, that is a really good question. And, you know, I, I don't like to say permanent um, because uh, I have seen some cases improve. Um, that being said, I think that the deeper sclerosis that occurs uh, in GVHD is very, very hard to reverse, okay? Um, it's sort of like having a scar and not being able to reverse the scar. Uh, so I tend to kind of, um, you know, work together with our patients on, on our expectations uh, and, and really try to focus on uh, the areas that are sort of functionally, um, you know, impacting uh, the patient's quality of life. Um, the cellulite change uh, can be cosmetically disturbing. Uh, it's maybe a reminder to the patient so it can be distressing that they have chronic graft resistosis. Um, but, you know, the short answer I'd say is that it's difficult to fully reverse it, uh, but I've had patients who've had improvement. And part of that is because sometimes chronic, the cellulite uh, is also associated with some swelling. And so if we can get the swelling down with things like compression stockings uh, and other, you know, uh, strategies, the the distension of the skin also improves, and so some of that dimpling improves. But it's certainly a common thing that can occur in graft resistance disease. Great, great answer and explanation and tactics to reduce. Um, the next question is, if someone has severe, or sorry, sensitive skin, and they have severe graft versus host disease, what are some best tips on how to exfoliate the skin safely? Yeah, so <clears throat> this really goes to um, uh, some of the, uh, to the part of the presentation where um, I was saying that it's very common for some patients to develop very excessive scaling. Uh, for example, here, um, this gentleman here, you can see has a lot of scaling. And so what are some of the best tips with that exfoliation or scaling? Well, um, A, I would say moisturizing very regularly is just a must. Um, and I tend to prefer greasier moisturizers like Aquaphor or just plain Vaseline. And uh, depending on how much scaling, I might even prescribe uh, medicines that are directly uh, aimed at dissolving some of the dead skin. So we call those keratolytics. And uh, those medicines are really good at kind of softening up heaped up or hyperkeratotic skin. Uh, a commonly used one is uh, urea, 40%. Cream, and so that's a prescription, and so you'll need to, you know, get that from your doctor or your dermatologist. But it's really helpful at helping to reduce um, some of the some of the scaling. I think dermatologists are really good at helping to manage that symptom because uh, we deal with a condition called psoriasis, um, which is effectively hyperkeratosis or a lot of scaling. And so we have a lot of strategies to try and decrease that scaling. And I, you know, I would encourage you to talk to your dermatologist or a dermatologist uh, about strategies aimed at that. Excellent. 
We are running out of time, so this will be our last question. Um, and I know you spoke about this in your presentation, um, but one of our audience members asked, um, has there been any progress on patients who have lost their fingernails uh, and or toenails? Um, they want to know if there's any new um, targeted agents um, or any new advances. So um, I have treated uh, some patients, sorry, my headphones fell out. Um, I, <clears throat> I have treated some patients with uh, intralesional injections of steroid uh, into the nail unit. Um, and it's a hard thing to manage because when you look at your skin and you see those scarred nails, um, you may think that uh, I, ha I actively have inflammation in my nail unit. That may not necessarily be the case. Um, you may have had an episode where you had the inflammation and it created an irre irreversible scar in the nail bed. And if that's the case, that nail stem cell may not be able to produce a normal nail again. But um, I do offer for the very motivated patients uh, an opportunity at least injecting the nail unit one or two times or three times um, in monthly intervals to see if there's an improvement. There have been some studies that show that systemic immunosuppressive therapies are helpful for nail um, disease. There haven't been any that are specifically looking at nail GVHD, but in correlates of non-transplant diseases such as lichen planus, nail lichen planus, there is some evidence that uh, systemic therapies are helpful. So, um, you know, it really depends on how kind of motivated I think the patients are in seeking out um, the uh, improvement in the nail um, and how much it affects their quality of life. Um, we can try all of these, you know, creative options, but they all come with their, you know, own side effects and their own potential for harm. And so um, I really try to balance out the impact of the skin condition on their quality of life before moving on to trying these sort of, you know, novel strategies. Um, while on, on one hand, they offer a lot of hope um, to patients who may not have great options, but on the other hand, they do come with, um, you know, their uh, own set of issues. And so we always have to kind of think about that risk benefit uh, when, when talking through these therapies. Dr. Modi, such an exceptional presentation this afternoon. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd really like to thank you, Dr. Modi, for your very helpful remarks, and thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. I, I, I truly mean it when I say it's, it's an honor to uh, be invited to present and really an honor to, to take care of, uh, of this population of patients. It's, it's really the main reason that I wanted to work at City of Hope. And um, uh, I am very hopeful for sort of the future of chronic GVHD and the uh, therapies that we'll see develop over the next decade. Thank you. Thank you.